It's actually great to speak up for Barcom because you just we sing in Hebrew La Rimlan Khatak or we are preparing for the smash to come out because it's very very interesting introduction to something that I'm trying to put together I'm replacing your ear for that. So I will not speak about nutrition that much. I will speak about physical activity in the elderly and relate to nutrition, not to disappoint too many people here. But I'm trying to get my knowledge about nutrition. But the thing about physical activity, and we'll see it, I'm using one of the uh, slides from Doc Andrew Murray. Is Andy here? He's one of the Scottish runners. Very interesting. And his, uh, his, his idea of best medicine, as you can see here, is fresh, clean air in the first place. Whoever lives in Tel Aviv or close to here, so <laughs> sleep, time with friends and family, which related to social yeah. advances of dancing anyway, but what I look at dancing and social more than anything. Healthy food, optimism, physical activity, which is most uh, important for him. Um, I'm going to start with a the, with the short introduction about the advancement of what we should pinpoint about the physical activity for the elderly. And basically what we look at the elderly today, is we're trying to, to prevent early mortality. I think the idea is I'm dealing and working with uh, early mortality and disability, we put it together. That's why we're working with aging, we're interested in aging, trying to prevent the inevitable. So we don't run forever, and, and, and you can see we die eventually, but we die later as running, as runners. And uh, one of the Swedish studies that look at that and compare, and what I pinpoint here, the two slides, it talks about the genetics risks versus lifestyle risks, how you combine them together. But you can see actually, I can re reduce significantly the, the, the uh, risk of, of early mortality by being active. So you, you can be born with risk factors genetics one. You can cut them significantly if you're active. That's one important. That's the message we, as a physician and others, deal with, with uh, professional health uh, providers should look at. So in this uh, study, being published uh, in the uh, Journal of American Geriatric Society last year, we're looking at the mortality and the combined genetic and behavioral risk, and you can see those risks of uh, three Um, you can see those risks that have been put here the genetics, one of them is lipoprotein E, which relating to dyslipidemia, insulin degrading enzyme relating to, to diabetes, and phosphatidyl, you know, the toll 3 can is important for aging, so, and, and cancer. If you more not know about those, alleles are important in res genetic risk factors. And you look at those with and without those uh, uh, risks, and with uh, a moderate and highly risk profile, moderate and low risk profile, a low risk profile. And you can see the effect along the line that the, uh, if you're active and you have uh, low risk profile, no risk behavior, which is smoking, uh, uh, leisure time, physical activity, moderate or, or highly active, and good social network, if you keep those four uh, lifestyle, you can cut, your, cut the risk of dying for genetic reason. You came to the world by about 50% and more. That's the idea behind uh, uh, this first presentation. And the other one is more specific to cardiovascular disease. We have, and this was published last year as well in New England. It talks about the genetic risk, adherence to healthy lifestyle, and coronary disease. And you can see that in any one of those groups, if you're looking at the genetic risk and the lifestyle risk, and this is our big cohort, prospective cohort, the Eric, the women, and the, uh, the other one, the third one. You're looking at all those big cohorts, and you can see in all of them that you can, if you keep yourself active, lifestyle, active lifestyle, you reduce your risk of coronary artery disease and dying early from coronary artery disease. So this, is the, uh, right? this is the introduction to what I'm trying to uh, pinpoint later on in the, in the lecture. So we're talking about evidence benefits about 30, at least 30 chronic diseases, what we call today non-communicable diseases. That when you're not in, 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 inseminate them, you're not infecting somebody, that was the problem in the 19th, 18th century. And there is a lot of studies about it. I'm not going to go all of them. And basically is, if you look at the, uh, you can see, 
to people who are not active about how much they can be less dementic as they grow older, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, hip fractures, type 1 diabetes, 40%, colon cancer, breast cancer, depression, you name it. We, when, when Marco was talking about running, um, and I'll jump uh, for, a minute, for a minute for running, I'll go in a minute for running. It talks about running as well, what it does for your aging. But I want to talk about the cost effectiveness of physical activity and prescribing physical activity in primary care. And what we know about physical activity and prescribing physical activity is the number needed to treat. And we don't talk about it enough. If you want to convert the smoker to non smoker, you have to invest a lot of money in people who know about it. It's like a consulting and workshop. You send them, you give them education, the whole shebang that are the least of works that you have to do to convert something and the conversion is only one number needed to treat is one to every 50 or 120 patients. Now if you want to convert somebody to, to exercise, the number needed to according to Canadian studies only 12. Why don't we invest enough in turning patients into active patients and we invest so much in smoking? I don't understand. I speak about it for the last There's no 30 years. There because there's no money here, there's a big industry about it, but we don't talk about it, we don't shout it about it. I must say that I'm doing it in the cardiovascular convention center. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe the only one who over every time goes to those lectures and says, guys, you should control your everything. All the studies that you do should control to lifestyle and physical activity. So you may find out we do the same thing what you do in medication, we can do with physical activity, just invest in it. So this thing again behind the cost effectiveness. And if you're looking at Canadian Academy of Sports Sciences and position statements later, at least recently released, they talk about the fact that 80%, more than 80% of the patient waiting for their doctor to tell them what to do. But the doctor don't know what to tell them. They don't understand about physical activity. So they just, I don't have a time. I have only five minutes for each patient. You get at least for excuses and what we have in exercise, no excuses. It's also for the doctors. No excuses related to exercise. <coughs> okay, so we should press them to learn what to do. They don't regularly assess or prescribe physical activity. If they discuss it, they don't give specific. So we try in the Israeli Society of Sports Medicine to create a course like that for physicians, and it's hard to change a system, a conventional system, to do what we want them to do. It takes time. And we have time. <laughs> time is what we have as we get aged. So we've seen that already. Um, look at the physical inactivity, for instance. And I, I don't want to pinpoint the fact that physical inactivity is an adherence problem. It's not a compliance problem. It's not a problem of knowledge. It's it's adherence problem. We don't adhere to it. The success of dancing is because people enjoy it and adhere to it. You give somebody a medication, he takes the medication. This is compliance. Whether he takes it every day, it's adherence. It's a big difference between the two. It's important if somebody get prescription for exercise or go to the gym and register, and whether he's exercised every two or three days for the last three, six months or a year. So this is an adherence problem, what we see. And we should push for that. This is the leading, fourth leading risk of overall morbidity and mortality, yet we don't push, push enough the, uh, the uh, adherence. And the guidelines talks about 150 minutes per week, moderate to vigorous physical activity, but at least four people out of five, 80% don't meet those guidelines. So is it a problem that we have 80% people don't reach in the guidelines? We talks about about 20% people doing whatever the guidelines tell us. Is it a problem? What do you think? <laughs> Do you see guidelines as something that it's like you have to obey to them? No, it depends on your personality if you obey guidelines yeah. and rules. Okay. But the things about guidelines, there's something between 0 and 150 as well. And those people don't talk about. It. And morbidity and mortality 
uh, uh, weekly report and, and recently published something that I would like to hear you and tell you that this patient, they take medication for blood pressure. So about 25% of them do not, do not adhere to the medication. For some reason, the good successful physician is about 70, 70 something percent with good result for them if somebody takes the medication. So it's about a quarter who are not using medication. Okay, look at exercise. About 25, 27% of people above the age of 40 have no physical activity outside of practice, the last five months as well. So we see adherence problem in medication as well in exercise. It's a similar case. We look at exercise as medicine, not is medicine, but as medicine. We should prescribe and tell them, adhere to it, and they should enjoy it. If they enjoy it like dancing, what Marcus said, they will probably continue doing it. So we should disseminate physical activity recommendation and adherence as well. Health Pro, everybody in the room should be trained and collaborate for optimal patient care. And we're looking at taking off the uh, non communicable disease off, out of the shelf, discuss it, talk about it. And every time we prescribe physical activity, we increase by 10% at least in active people and convert them. So it's about 1 to 10, 1 to 20 uh, conversion number needed to treat, as I said before. Affecting self goes up if we talk about people with risk, uh, chronic disease, with age, because people feel more necessary to do that. If we assess the motivation, habits, and preferences, and, and barriers, and we make sure that the message and the goals are clear and simple, use valid behavior changes, approaches, and proper follow-up, see what they do, and detects about two questions at the clinic. No matter if you're a physician, exercise physiologist, or what, phys physiotherapist, two questions. Were you active last week? And how much you were active last week? Two questions and you have the information. You don't need enough time, you need 10 seconds to do it, and you can start the whole therapy, the changes. Talking about running, this is a study being published this year, a few months ago, it talks about the uh, ability to reduce early mortality by running. And you can see the physical inactivity here, in this case is a non-runner, is a risk factor almost like the first one, like the uh, uh, hypertension. So if you consider the population attributable fraction that physical activity contribute to early mortality, it's similar like it's considered in the first place, but it's similar like the first place. 25% and 28% are very close to each other, okay? If you're running, okay, you are reducing it significantly, and that's what they did. They since running is one of the most popular and conventional visual physical activity, it's informative to compare, and that's what they did. They compared and they find out that can you reduce it, and I'm not presenting it here because it's short of time, but every year, every hour that you're running, you are reducing, as continuously, you're reducing at least by seven years eventually at your uh, early, uh, how do we say in Hebrew, there's a date for everybody? <laughs> postpone the date for everybody for about seven years. Okay. Uh, effectiveness, Stanford University talks about the equivalent of superior health benefit physical activity. It's medication is better than medication for stroke patients. Physical activity proved to be better than medication what you give the stroke. Yes, it's problematic to make somebody who been who having a stroke to be active because of the uh, disability. Yes, but if he will be active, if you uh, adapt it to him and find the, got the right program for him, you will be better, you will do a better job for him than medication. And there is a dose response, what I was talking about. It. For each 10 minutes physical activity accumulated, you reduce by 10% the relative, uh, uh, relative risk for early mortality. And this is between the 0 to 150 minutes I was talking about in the guideline. And you can do reduces, as I said, almost to like 50% reduction if you reach between 32 to 40, 44% at 150 minutes uh, uh, activity, depending on the amount, how intense your physical activity. The more intense those physical activities you do, you get the better uh, percentage of reduced reduction. So it's a dose response here. And then the plateau around the 50%, which is important to say, so you can exercise like crazy, like other people, so you reach about 750 minutes per week, which is about, how many hours is that? 12, 12 and a half. More than 12, 12 and a half hours. 
And there are people doing it twice a day, running long, dis running long distances and so, and they're adapted to it, and they're doing well. They, but they reach a plateau about the benefit as compared to the uh, genetic uh, risk. But what's important to say to our patient that this, even those who run in a lot, there's no mortality increase at increasing physical activity. So there has been some cardiologists in the literature saying that a certain amount of physical activity will kill you. There are changes in the right ventricle, which we learn about it. If people are prone to it, exercising too much, develop them. So we should know, but in the big cohort study looking at it, there was no, recently it was published, there was no increased mortality, increased physical activity in generally healthy population. If somebody has risk factors, he may develop those complications. All those small studies, the O'Keefe and other cardiologists talks about it, are not a small anecdotal studies and not looking at all those studies didn't find an increased uh, mortality. Whoever died early for, more, for extra physical activity is because you have some risk factor that you didn't find it before. That's what we believe today. And the benefit to carry a very small amount. Even if you do 70 to 90% to minutes per week, you reduce by 15%, more than 10% I was talking about for each minute, for each 10 minutes it's 15%, it's 10%. You increase it, so in the beginning you have the best benefit. So moving people from inactive or sedentary to being active, even a little bit, will change their life. And the elderly, this is the problem, to get them moving and doing things. Dear Ms. Rowan, we talked about it, cost effectiveness, the brief counseling, two questions I was talking about. Let's move. And, and the recent one for this, uh, introduction is about the uh, sedentary behavior and how we change it. The slogan that we use more today, more and more, is sit less and move more. It's a nice slogan, the American Heart Association using it. It talks about the fact that you're sitting and you're working, sitting too much in your butt and you're not moving, get up and move every few minutes, like half an hour to go and do something. And the uh, slogan is move routinely and exercise habitually. Which is, if you look in those, in, in those around you, you can find that those are willing to uh, and willing and able to stand and move along the day and exercise once a day. Those people are likely to benefit from both of them. If you're looking at those who are obligated to sit routinely, or to do, but able to exercise once a day, they will create. They will certainly benefit from that exercise that they're doing once a day. And there is a group that's not inclined to exercise, but will get up and move. And they're also, we don't have enough information on that, on that group. More research will determine the right prescription for them because we're actually researching the sedentary behavior, how to change it, and what the effect of sedentary behavior. It's just in the beginning of this research. <coughs> so the advisory of the American Heart Association, very clear about it. And they're talking about the non-communicable disease and the living threat to global health. And physical inactivity is a, is a large contributor to this problem, especially in the aging population. It's four leading risk factor, but we know that if you do an attributable analysis, you can find it very close to the first place. And our mission is to get people to move routinely, exercise habitually, to provide a simple and safe exercise plan and discuss effectiveness ratio, which is important because what we fall very quickly into, one of the pitfalls that we fall very quickly into is those patients coming to me, yes, but I don't have the time. So can you give me an exercise program that can do it in five minutes? Yes, of course. <laughs> High intense interval training that can do it in five minutes, 10 seconds. And those are the pitfalls that we're talking about because there is a cost effectiveness here. Yes, you can do it in a short time, but you're going to have so much injury risk, so you may be prone to injure it and stop exercising at all. So there is a cost effectiveness when you consult people talk about the side effect, not, that, not just the efficacy of what you are recommending. Now we're going to a study that talks about the elderly and obese patient. This study was published in the New England last month. <coughs> and people were talking about uh, uh, the study is uh, the study was looking at the lifestyle intervention trial in obese uh, elderly in New Mexico, New Mexico Medical School, and the uh, medical school uh, and the VA administration over there, the hospitals over there. And then what prescribing exercise and diet. Control group, exercise and diet. And the exercise is divided into three groups. One of the group was um, one of the group was just aerobic, the other one was just uh, uh, resistant training, and the other one was a combined training. 
And they all lose, lost weight similarly. As you can see here, the all three groups lost weight, weight changes. Very similar, no much difference between all those three groups. However, the effect of losing weight was there. But the type of training that we're trying to get in this lecture to talk about it is important. What we see here, and they did measure it in the, the primary outcome was a, f a frailty. We look at frailty and other changes, and look at, the, at, at, the, at this uh, uh, um, objective measurement of, of frailty, which they called physical performance test. And they did in physical performance, and they gave them uh, uh, nine tasks, seven tasks that, uh, that you see here, walking, uh, putting and removing a coat, pick up a penny, stand up from a chair, things that looking to you in this group, very easy to do. But this group, this is this uh, 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 subject group, so was about 65 years old and more, and they, some of them, that was not getting obviously into this uh, perfect, what we look at it, the perfect uh, uh, functioning, and the result. Uh, it also did uh, uh, ups and downs for flight of stairs, another two or two more of tasks, and they gave each one of them from zero to four, and the total was 36 for the, for a successful the best uh, performance possibly, objective performance with fertility. And you can see the changes in the control, okay, in the aerobic, and the resistant, and the combined effect. And you basically can see the combined effect is a lot, is better solution training effect for elderly people while they're in program for losing weight, I should say. And you can see the other peak of VO2 was similar to the aerobic, so they don't lose much by training also with resistance. Mean body mass, they lost a little bit less uh, than the aerobic and more from the uh, just the resistance, which is clear. So we lose lean body mass as we lose weight. And there's a quarter principle you want to know every time you lose a kilo, you lose at least 25% of lean body mass. So we're trying to preserve lean body mass in the elderly. As an important, we should pay attention to how much we lose it, and important for training and resistance, because we're losing less in resistance just aerobic. But if you talk to the elderly population, what type of exercise like they do, they're doing mostly aerobic. Walking, oh, well, even no dancing, man. if you want it, if not as much as resistance, they should put some more uh, 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 resistance training into it. And I'm not talking about just uh, what we talk about uh, here, uh, those parameters of function at all. Uh, if you look at the muscular, uh, neuromuscular junction effect, you're probably going to see a lot better response if you train them with resistant training just than just dancing or aerobic as well. Okay. <laughs> so we see the functional state as well. We see the total heat response, which is important this age. We're losing less in the uh, combined, and even in the strength, you see the result is very compared to the resistance. So there's a good, good idea of why you train people in resistance training and combined training. And the effect you can see in the gait speed and the survival of other people, so well, they will be able to walk faster, and their survival will be, I mean, median survival in years will be better if they just be able to walk faster, and training will take them there. I will skip this, and I'm trying to look a look about talk about the muscle and some pro and some uh, nutritional support. So you can see here, if you train people with resistant training, you train different type of muscle fiber, and the effect of them. People try to look at the specific effect of them on that, uh, depending on the intensity you do, how much training intensity and muscle hypertrophy, and you can find that it's very very low relative intensity count. It, it counts only for 18 percent of external <coughs> variance. Uh, or, or even 35 is not that good, but you still you see the effect. It's not, it's not that it's not there, but it's not clear. Same thing if you're looking trying to separate for different fibers for physical activity. But what's important to look at the, at the uh, what's happening in the muscle is the mu muscle protein synthesis and how much we can increase muscle protein synthesis in order to protect the muscle, in order to protect it from losing lean body mass. As we age, as we, uh, if we're not exercising with resistant training, we should add resistant training and nutritional support. And we can see here the idea of training and resistant training. And people here, there's enough uh, muscular people here that train, they know how many repetitions they should do, one RM, how many, eight to 12. That's what people do. You want to work on power, you have to reduce uh, the amount of uh, repetition and increase the intensity. All that everybody here in this room probably know that. 
the fact is, and the truth is, if you look at this study, what you saw, the reason I brought it here, to show you that you can do even 30 repetition and reach the same effect of muscle protein synthesis. This is the last thing, last week's study. You don't have to get to a plateau of 60 to 90% one or end, which you see here, getting to a relatively plateau. But you can do more repetition at a low intensity, providing you're working on volitional fatigue. You're reaching a volitional fatigue. If you're exercising very lightly, small weight, but exercising long enough until you get to volitional fatigue, you get to the same level of muscle protein synthesis, and that's what's important in this study. I'm not going to get into it because of time, but we show you that the effect of lean body mass is important because we preserve the basal metabolic rate because the basal metabolic rate, the western metabolic rate, depends on our lean body mass. Okay? The diet only gets you here, you lose a lot. Aerobic takes you here. But if you do strength as well, you're losing less of... Uh, and about the anabolic, so about the nutritional support. Take in mind for you that there is anabolic resistance in the elderly. If you give them, them protein, they are not responding as we were young. So if I'm taking the same amount of protein as a 20, compared to 20 years old or 30 years old, I'm not responding the same. My myofibrillar uh, building, my myofibrillar uh, protein uh, synthesis will be slower, as you can see in the lower graph, as opposed to the young people. They're getting a faster metabolism in that specific doses, okay? So we're talking about reduced sensitivity on anabolic processes and we're getting ages. So we're talking about reduced levels of muscle, muscle protein synthesis and different leucine uh, threshold. Leucine is the amino acid that's important to trigger protein synthesis. We need to have it as we eat in our diet in our protein. And the optimal dose is about 30 to 40 gram proteins. That's a recommended one in order to be able to create a maximum postprandial muscle protein synthesis. And you can see the response here for a healthy muscle, young muscle, as opposed to an older muscle with a, a anabolic resistance. It does resist the muscle. We can say it, but if you train it and if you feed it, you can overcome those resistance. And, and the idea is to preserve muscle, muscle tissue. Uh, it's limited if you take the muscle protein synthesis limited. If you take only gram, one, 10 grams in, in, uh, of protein in, in, uh, in a meal, it's increasing for 20 and it's optimal about 30. For young people, it's about 25 to 30. It's older people because of the re anabolic resistance. We talk about 35 to 40 grams of protein per dinner that we're taking, okay? And you can see it here, one of those studies, we're looking at the study they did in breakfast, how much they gave in lunch and dinner. Eventually, the rat averages around the 25 to 30. So if we can summarize it and say the meal requirements for protein to optimize metabolic roles of amino acid. So we talked about amount of dietary protein the meal requires to initiate anabolic response in skeletal muscle. This is derived by leucine content. We need at least two to three grams uh, leucine in each in, in any cup of those 30 to 40 uh, grams uh, protein. Uh, intercellular loads are necessary to trigger muscle protein synthesis, also oxidation of uh, brain chains amino acid. And the aging produce anabolic uh, resistance, as I told, which require essential amino acid to achieve maximal TOR signaling and muscle protein. We need more proteins to get to this activation and signaling muscle protein synthesis. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, Ron. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, I have a question about uh, when you speak about the old age, the, one of the main goals are to preserve the ADL function, what's called TDP of daily living. I wanted to ask if uh, resistance training on 30% of 1RM is sufficient enough to preserve not just the uh, muscle mass, but we need also strength because the, one of the first goal in the old age, as I understood, is to prevent uh, falling and cause of death after this. Yeah, I see it a lot in, in, in my cardiac rehab. You see patients coming after cardiac event. And you see they're going to have a hard time uh, 
tying their shoes, like this, okay, or, or bending over. This is a daily physical activity we talk about ADL. Okay? So even if you ask them to do a squat, they will never to do it, they cannot do a squat or get closer. So think about 30% is something we created as a measurement. But if you do an ADL, ask them to stand and holding a chair or something and just get down and do those exercises. This is about 30 to 40 percent, not much as you're asking about it. This is not as difficult without extra weight. They're not able to do it, but if they keep doing it twice a day while they're brushing their teeth, then they're getting a lot better. And they're not because you increase their aerobic capacity within the first few weeks, because they increase their response, muscle response, neuromuscular junction is functioning better. We have a better neurological response to the exercise in the beginning before we see hypertrophy or changes in training. So talking about ADL or preventive falls, small exercises, lightweight, without weight at all, with body weight exercises, stable enough to hold something will do the job for you. Okay. Uh, if I can uh, go with this answer. This is, uh, you gave an example for people that are starting to work out. But what are we doing with people today? Nowadays, I'm very happy to see that people at the ages of 60s and 70s and even 80s, they are very active, they're very strong. And for them, I want to make sure that they will stay strong and I want to activate them even higher. So I think that for them to yeah. think about 30%. No, of R1, I can even We're not talking about ADL yeah. for those people. They're doing a lot more. No, I'm not ADL. talking about ADL. No, I think okay. this is not a problem. We were talking about ADL. This is a super aging athlete or aging athlete, which is active. And I don't have anything to add for them. Maybe changing a little bit any resistant training because it will help them to lose less lean body mass if you add resistant training to the regular training. Yeah, Most of them are walking or running or swimming or doing things like that. Resistant training is important for them as they get older. And, and some nutritional support, a, a bigger or stronger increase one as opposed to what they used to do when they are younger. No. Perhaps I could uh, add to that to your reply uh, regarding the 30%. 30% of course is the beginning of the exercise. As the exercise progresses, they are effectively recruiting, because it's done to volition, they recruit all motor units. Uh, so it, it, it is very important from a metabolic point of view, uh, because it, it engages uh, more the metabolism for us. It is a longer duration, it's more sustainable, and it reduces cardiovascular risk. But at the same time, because it's more, the total volume is greater, or is the same as 80% as, uh, exercise. 30%, it seems to some people low here if you want to attach to those, those, those things. But if you do them to volitional fatigue, yeah, exactly. that's what they do. And they're doing 10 times like length of their fatigue. You increase the muscle protein synthesis anyway, and you build the muscle and improve the normal muscular junction. Exactly. This is the uh, one that the sedentary population, as opposed to the uh, uh, people with, uh, uh, with uh, active people. If you, you just modify the program for the, for the active people, to what they're not doing yet. If they're not doing resistant training, even though the, the, the resistant training is a simple one, just keep telling them that you do it to evolution of fatigue. You don't have to, you know, some people, especially those who are running and do all those activities, think they have to go through the wall, what we say, in order to feel. You have to feel that you really work, otherwise you're not doing the job. Right? This is not, this is not true, because you want to affect as you get aging, and a better muscle, a better protect your metabolism, you do a lightweight, whatever, but you keep doing it enough to get to volition of fatigue. The same exercising, you don't do it 10 times or 12 times, do it 30 times. Okay? But will this and 30 times what? give me also the uh, increase in, uh, no, in bone metabolism? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Just by getting to fatigue, yes. even if I'm not loading the we talk bone. about muscle, right? I'm talking about muscles, but I'm also talking about the yeah, bone. Yeah, no, but we're talking about muscles. Mm -hmm. What the muscle study, do? they didn't measure uh, what the bone mass do? density. Yeah, of course. The muscle work on the bone. Okay. Of course, but is it the muscle enough? attached to the bone. This is a, this is a stimulation that you have. It's in fact, I'm going to have less injuries, mm -hmm. more muscle protein synthesis. And if I'm not going to be hypertrophic as I want to be, maybe, or go to the uh, <laughs> contest, then I'll still be healthy and, and my bones will be yeah, better. Because I mean, I'm doing it. What you're doing it, you're doing it in the upright, weight-bearing exercise, which are affecting the bones anyway. Yeah, of course, but there's a big there's a big range between 30% to thinking about elite sports. Obviously, I'm not talking there, I'm talking obviously. about... But we say, I, I believe so, I don't have... The study said that the same effect on the muscle probably <coughs> going to be on the bone as well. 
and you take it yourself long enough time to exercise it and do the stimulation on the bone in any way. So okay, the last question or comment? Yeah. 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 Good, so great, both of you guys, great uh, talks. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with a thought. That I'm going to pick up later on the motivation piece because fun is a piece of the discussion. Um, there are companies in, in the U.S. now uh, trying to look at financial incentive models because fun is great to keep you motivated, but for the people that aren't taking this medicine, uh, so for example, if you work at Cerner Healthcare in, in Kansas City, every day you take 10,000 steps, you get a dollar. <laughs> Straight up. So you get a dollar every day. Um, and there are a whole number of companies that are now experimenting with motivation and financial modeling for motivation. And, and the upshot is it does not take much money at all, but it takes a little bit of money for prevention. And so I just want to leave with the thought of not only fun, but also financial modeling as a way of changing behavior. It's the only thing that actually works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If you look at Ray, you look at the waste traffic average. People are accruing thousands of these waste points. They mean nothing. They mean zero. But everybody wants to get waste points for no reason. They don't mean anything. We have lunch. I want to thank all the great people.